To kick off the scientific proceedings, I'd like to introduce our first plenary speaker, David Bellwood. David was born in Huddersfield in Yorkshire. He completed an honours degree at the Uni University of Bath, Bath in 1980. He finished his PhD at JCU in 1985 and returned in 1988, first as a postdoc and then as a lecturer. David's been a full professor at JCU since 2004 and a member of the Australian Academy of Sciences since 2016. And he was awarded a prestigious ARC Laureate Fellowship last year, which I believe he's going to use to, to do great things. David has a wide range of research interests. He's been known to describe himself as an academic gibbon. It's fair to say that his work focuses on fish, but he's used fish in a wide variety of fascinating ways to explore a series of important questions in ecology, with a particular focus on ecological function. So it's a pleasure to ask David to come to the podium. Thank you very much, Graham. And uh, as, as a given, I will uh, hopefully uh, try and get this organized. Now, I need to uh, share my screen. Here we go. Let's see if we can do that. Um, from the beginning. Um, there we go. So, what I'd like to do today is I, I want to talk to you about coral reef science and how I uh, think it's going to go in the future. This is um, a, a perspective largely from fish, but I hope you'll understand how things are, are, are changing. So what I want to do is quickly run over where we've been and where we're likely to go next. So in terms of the chronology of coral reef science, Back in the 80s, we were at the end of a long period where people have been looking at taxonomy. So a lot of the interest that people were expressing was in what's there, we needed to name things. And that continues to this day, but, but the numbers of workers in this area has dropped off. We started to see in the 80s and in the 90s, a lot more attention paid to ecology, documented distributions and trophic interactions. So that was the kind of work that was being done. And then we moved on to demographic studies. This was very, very strong in the 80s. It continues to this day, but again, it's uh, eased off a fair bit. It went from recruitment through to marine protected areas and connectivity, trying to understand how these things were interacting. And in recent decades, in the last uh, two decades, there's been a huge emphasis on the resilience of reefs, talking about how reef uh, systems are changing, phase shifts and documentation of declines. So there's been extensive documentation around the world. And today, people are looking at a world where this is the kind of background we're having to deal with. There's uh, declines almost everywhere in terms of coral cover. And this has set the scene for many young people's research projects, that this is the world you're living in. And we're having to come to terms with a, a rapidly transforming world. The question that arises from this is, what happens next? What's going to be the next kind of main theme and how are we going to move forwards? So in terms of this, we had a meeting, uh, Graham led on Magnetic Island a while ago. I've discussed this before, and this was to try and get to grips with that problem. What are we going to do next? And what came out of this was uh, the clear mismatch in terms of spatial skills, where the, the scale of the threats today is much, much larger than it ever has been, yet the scale of our response is often quite small, and hence the term that we came up with, cosmetic conservation. It appears to be conservation, but its ecological footprint is likely to be relatively small. Um, and at the same time in this meeting, we also recognized by data looking at the Great Barrier Marine Park Authority's annual reports, the change in nature of Grabampa's underlying goals. So in other words, what is it that we're hoping to conserve? What is it that we want to protect on reefs? And as you can see, it's changed over the years from iconic species largely to biodiversity today and a new thing that's emerging. And this is ecosystem function. And this seems to be something that's going to lay the foundations for the next few decades. It reflects that Grabumpa's uh, emphasis, changes are occurring in the scientific community as well. So people are talking about uh, maintaining ecological functions. Now, this is an interesting thing in that we all recognize it's important, and this is how the word function has been used in the literature and how it's increased in recent years. 
I'm part of this increase in the use of the term function, but it wasn't until 2019 that I had to write a paper because I didn't really understand what it was. The term function we've used a great deal. We recognize that it's important, but we didn't have a definition for it. So we had a definition in 2019, it's relating to the movement of storage of energy or material. It applies to cellular levels or to global ecosystems. The thing that came out of this study though, was a functionality crisis. We realized that we like the term, we understand what it means, but we don't really have the application in terms of the ability to understand how things are functioning. So we realize that function is important, but not how to reveal it. So for example, most functions are estimated based on functional traits, as they're called. This produces functional diversity estimates or functional space estimates and lots of other derivative terms. But to define the functions, we're using these traits. And an example of a trait for fishes is whether it's solitary or not. The problem is, what does solitary actually mean? So if you say, oh, well, these fishes are solitary and those aren't, therefore the trait that they have is what? It, it's, it's solitary, but what function does that refer to? So how are these functionally different? So we have this functionality crisis. We, we have difficulties identifying what the functions are. So how are we going to address this? Well, we're, I've just established, uh, we launched it a short while ago, the function hub. And that is specifically the question we're going to try and address, how to go from a trait to a function and to unlock that functional door so we can actually understand how coral reefs are functioning. That is the main goal. However, before we started the first stop, we said, well, let's have a look at the data that we've got to work with. What is it that we have in terms of the basic data that we can build these functions on? Now, if you look at fish, and this is an example, so we assume that this square is all the fishes that are present on a reef. And we already know from talks in the past that if you ignore the cryptobenthic fishes, these little small gobies in their kin, we're going to lose about half of the fishes that are present on the reef. We don't count them, we don't see them. There's also a problem of diver effects. This is a graph by Justin Welsh showing at what distance from the observer these fishes swim away. So if you're a diver, you're quite scary, less so if you're a snorkeler, and even less so if you're on a kayak. So the fishes disappear. The question is how many of them? Well, estimates, Emsley suggested up to 70% of individuals are missed. Dickens suggested that on average about half the individuals are missed. So these are the individuals that are there available to be counted that we don't actually count. So in other words, of all the fishes on the reef, we're now down to about 25%. So our reef study is actually based on just 25% of the fishes there. We wanted to get a better handle of this in terms of what it is we're doing and what our data set is like before we start adding the functions to the top of it. So we did a study. Our colleagues and I looked at 37 years of research. This is based in the journal Coral Reefs because it's the most uh, all-encompassing journal we could find. And we looked at 377 articles. Now, these are the articles where we looked at just field-based work, so that it's not purely experimental, and we recorded that how, when, where, and what was being studied. This is focusing on fish, but for the functions, we're going to go to corals, we're going to go to oceanography, we're going to go to evolutionary paleontology, but this is just a fish example for today. How do we... Uh, survey our fishes, well it's interesting. The vast majority of studies don't tell us in sufficient detail how they did the surveys. So we don't know whether or not there's likely to be any diver effect. But of those studies that do specify the technique they used, the majority of them use methods that are likely to be scaring fishes off. So only a small subset use methods that avoid diver effects. As a consequence, that 25% is likely to be true. And what this means is if we want to understand the full functionality of coral reefs, we're going to have to look beyond standard fish counts. There's a lot more out there that we're not counting. We then looked at, so in essence, yes, most studies do miss that 25%. This is likely to be true. So we then looked at when we do the studies. And the answer is, well, we're, we're, we're warm water divers. The vast majority of scientists do most of their work in the summer. 
there's twice as much work done in the summer as in the winter. We don't like cold water. So if we were going to look at full functionality of a reef, we've got to be aware there's a seasonal bias in there. We have data on summer reefs, but winter reefs, we don't particularly understand. We study them a lot less. This isn't going to change the numbers, but it does change our awareness of what it is we're actually understanding. We also looked at where we do our work, and this was quite instructive. We find that the vast majority of studies are based on the reef slope and the reef crest. We strongly avoid the reef flat. So what this means is, despite the, flat, this, despite the fact that the flat is something like two to three times the area of all of the other habitats combined, we don't bother looking at it. So if we want to understand reef functionality, we need to be aware of the context of our data, and to date, most of it is focused on a very few habitats. We're probably going to need a broader focus if we're going to understand what's going on. The most instructive of the lot, oh, oh sorry, well, we've missed reef flats out. So that's reducing our 25%, probably down to 15 or 20% of what's there is what we're counting. So the last one. What is it that we're studying? Well, this was interesting. This asked the question, which fishes are we actually looking at? And if I show you this figure, I already know where your eyes are because of our studies showing us exactly what it is that you want to see. And the answer is, you like the yellow fishes. If we looked at all of the studies, there was an overwhelming preponderance of studies done on yellow fishes. So we looked at all of the colors of the fishes. So we asked, what color are the fishes that we study? And the answer is yellow. Which ones do we avoid? Well, the very dark colored ones. But this could be biased by the uh, number of species that are out there that are the different colors. So we corrected for the number of species and we found we got exactly the same result. But then you say, well, this could be driven by the number of individuals. Maybe there's lots of yellow individuals and not so many of the others. We corrected for the number of individuals and it's an even stronger signal. The bottom line is, no matter what you're doing and where you're doing it, there seems to be, for coral reef scientists, an overwhelming desire to study yellow fishes. So when you look at two reefs, which of these are you going to study first? Well, I'd guess there's a clear answer. One's got yellow fishes, and that's probably the one we prefer. And it appears that this preference is a subconscious bias. We had no idea that we had such a strong desire to study yellow fishes when we started, but it seems as if it's very strong, and it occurs in all, pretty much all oceans as far as we can see. So the bottom line is, in terms of what we think we're studying, that's what we have in terms of the numbers, but there seems to be a bias in there. We're focusing in on mainly the yellow ones. We're looking at a small subset of what's there. What does this mean for the future? Well, we are missing things, but does it actually matter? Well, if you look at these areas, the cryptobenthic fishes, and see what's going on in there in terms of functions, this is a recent study. What we found is that the reefs, the waters around them are full of cryptobenthic larvae. If you put this into a model, churn it around, the eventual result is that something like 57% of all consumed fish biomass is cryptobenthic fishes. So in other words, the fishes we don't count account for almost half of the process of flesh transfer on reefs. It's huge. We completely miss it. If you look at the wary fishes, these are the parrot fishes, and these are often the ones that disappear before they can be counted, using a technique that's specifically designed to count these parrot fishes, what we find is that parrot fishes are able to produce harvestable flesh for humans, even when the biomass has been depleted. So in other words, they've got this buffering capacity and damaged reefs in terms of human overfishing or disturbance of other sources can still sustain fisheries for people because of the remarkable ability of these fishes but we would have missed this had we used, in all likelihood, traditional surveying techniques. And what this shows is that that area that is outside the fishes that we're often counting has important functions, and we've got to be careful. So this is the way the world looks. There's a relatively narrow focus that we have in traditional surveying methods, but there's a clear awareness of the need to look outside. As a consequence, when we look at the future, 
these fissures are still important. The work that we've done so far is not wrong. It is just restricted in terms of its scope. We've got to broaden our horizons, and that is what we're going to be doing. The functions that we're interested in aren't just reef crest functions looking at fissures. We want to look at corals, oceanography, evolution, paleontology. It's a system-wide approach, but what we've got to do is recognize that we've made some really good first steps, but there's a hell of a lot more to do, and that is where the excitement lies. We've got more fish, more corals, more functions to reveal, and all of this is likely to be happening in the near future. It's an exciting time, reefs are changing, but functions actually don't seem to be changing quite as much. There's a lot of promise in there for more positive outcomes for coral reefs, and that is what we're looking forward to revealing within the next few years. So it's a bizarre way of talking to you all. I wish I could see you uh, directly in front of me instead of just talking in the office, but uh, I wish you well, and I hope the conference goes well for the rest of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. It's Alana here. Uh, I'll be moderating your questions. If anyone in the audience has a question for David, can you please type it in using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen? Um, and I will be able to relay that question to David. At the moment, we don't actually have any questions in the Q&A box, but I, I have love a it. <laughs> the, pres the pressure's on you now, Alana. Okay. I know, I was like, okay. ask me. I've got a question for you. And I respect that you've, recently just opened a hub called the Reef Function Hub, but I was quite interested in the slide that you showed about how Boomfra priorities as observed within their reports have changed over time, and that we're seeing a sort of a growth within biodiversity in the last few years, and now we're seeing mentions of reef function. But if you could think about perhaps what might be happening in the next 10 and 20 years, what is the frontiers beyond reef function you think that they'll be focusing on? I think function has got a long, time to run, we've only just scratched the surface, it's gonna take us maybe 30, 40 years before we have a really good handle on this. I'll, I'll tell the truth, the reality is pretty much everything that's going to be done, I think, in function was already started in the 80s, but it went into uh, excavation. A lot of the basic breakthroughs had been made, but they were put on the back shelf because recruitment seemed to be so much more important. And in a way, it was because we were locked into the assumption that systems were in equilibrium. We needed to know how they were being maintained with the assumption that nothing was going to change. 1998 changed that worldview. All of us mm -hmm. in reef systems that are in transition, and as a consequence, stable state dynamics are an irrelevance. What we need to know is how systems change. Functions give us a key is into understanding systems What's emerging is that the functions themselves may be far more resilient than the taxa are themselves. So in other words, we can lose corals, we can lose fishes, but reefs will continue in a different way. 